Okay, so this is the 35th lecture in the lecture series about creating an international sustainable civilization. Um, the cluster of lectures I'm in the middle of or toward the end of at this point is about the tradition of prophets and how all the the major world religious traditions, um, I would call wisdom traditions, spiritual traditions, have the original icons were what I would call a prophet. And I'm arguing that the prophets all had the virtues of Aristotle. So this particular one is Muhammad. And considering the original motive for this lecture series was to have a class, the lectures related to a philosophy class or on um, taught in Indonesia at the University of Indonesia, but also a group of professional uh, professors, teachers, lecturers at Islamic State Universities who are focused on Panchasila and its application to international culture today and also to creating a curriculum for Indonesian Islamic institutions of education. So given, given that background, of course, I hesitate to speak about Muhammad since people listening know a lot more than I do. And so I want them to know that I know they know more. So all I'm doing here is presenting the little bit I know based on the materials uh, that link Muhammad to the same patterns, the same basic uh, virtues and vices, life stories that I think are related to the human condition and that I think is at least part of the branch of Islam that's humanistic and that is that branch of Islam is the one that can be brought together with the other religions. So that branch fits with Panchasila, religious pluralism, humanitarianism, and all five of the principles of Panchasila. It also links to the working group at the Pontifical Academy in Rome that met together to find a common foundation that also supports the United Nations Sustainable Sustainability Development Goals. So that's basically what the next, this lecture and the next one are going to be about, sort of interpreting Islam through those filters. And um, the people in Indonesia, the Muslims, can just add to it if they want to contact me and um, criticize something as if it's inaccurate in a way that's serious and important, they can certainly do that. So um, this is the one about Muhammad as a prophet. Uh, so here is the, here's the YouTube that I'm posting all of these lectures on. And the other YouTube that's related to Greek philosophy, civilization. Okay, so um, Houston Smith's book starts out with this quote from Meg Greenfield, 1979. No part of the world is more hopelessly and systematically and stubbornly misunderstood by us than that complex of religion, culture, and geography known as Islam. So that's been true for so long. I mean, the story of these misunderstandings is horrible, but the story of the humanistic tradition where the Greek humanistic tradition was sent over to Persia and the Mideast and preserved there, brought to Southern Spain, that's a really important story. I doubt that Meg Greenfield knew that story, that part of world history because it really hasn't been seriously brought 
into the mainstream, either academic or general public publications until certainly since 1979. Uh, I would guess that it had a leap forward after 9-11, but I'm not sure. So Muhammad's childhood and coming of age has similarities with Confucius, Buddha, Jesus, and the other prophets. He was an orphan, which meant his wisdom, the, the theme is that wisdom is not based on a privileged life, life or a privileged education. So if you remember, Confucius was poor. I think he was an orphan also. Uh, Buddha was the son of a king, but he rejected the Brahmins who had all the um, privilege and the education of privilege, he said that isn't what liberation is about. It should, it's not fundamentally what Hinduism about is about. So he himself lived a very impoverished life physically, but it was spiritually rich. Jesus was a carpenter's son. Um and uh, Socrates, that we'll get to next, was um, a stonecutter's son. So that's a major theme, is that, the and Aristotle would frame it this way, the moral virtues are learned through habit in childhood, and, they're, and they culminate in practical wisdom. Practical wisdom has to guide the intellectual virtues. So, societies tend to take institutions of higher education and link intellectual training to the status quo, to people in power, obviously, because they're, they want to educate the best and the brightest to support their power and their worldview. So, so the system is sort of set up to have the best and the brightest be reactionary, conservative, and easily corrupted. So if people already have power, it's very easy to abuse it. And that's why it's important that these iconic figures, the prophets of world history, didn't have that privilege or they rejected it. It's also why it's important that Students at UN schools, students anywhere in the world get an education in, I would say, you know, Greek, natural and spiritual, spiritual humanism and religious pluralism combined with an education in STEM and uh, left-brained activities that are the foundation for the next wave of economic development. Because you can't have the moral development stuck in the past. It, it'll be ignored and it'll be powerless or it will cause harm. Um, and then you can't have the STEM, the next generation of wealthy people, educated, who are greedy, <laughs> power hungry, uh, all they want is influence. This is what we have now, and this is a serious problem. So linking these together, again, I think Aristotle's model is the best because it's so systematic, it's so comprehensive, but it's not entirely comprehensive. You could get other insights from other traditions, and I think you could plug it into this basic framework. That's my... Uh, commitment that's as far as I know that would be a good starting point they were all serious you know good kids growing up they wanted to take life seriously they they all grew up in a very corrupt situation and so they might have had a destiny to be serious or children can have a destiny to be good administrators they can have a destiny to be artists they can have a destiny to be teachers, um, all sorts of destinies that you have apart from whether your society is corrupt 
or relatively healthy or whatever. But these people happen to come of age and live at a time of corruption, which is a lot more normal and sometimes severe corruption. And they, so they combine their seriousness and their destiny to be serious to a confrontation with the corruption of their culture. And I think in general, I don't know how many serious people, I would imagine every serious person at some point in some ways will run into corruption and have to speak out. So we can all be prophets. We don't necessarily have that as our only calling, as basically how we're remembered. Um, someone who sees the corruption of the educational system might become an eighth grade science teacher. So they are a prophet in the sense they understand the corruption and they live their calling, but that's not how they are remembered. They're remembered as a good science teacher and good mentor to junior high kids. So Confucius grew up in the period of the warring states, a complete breakdown in civilization. And he started civilization, <laughs> deliberate tradition. Um, you know, traditions aren't started from zero and they usually aren't deliberate. They're usually just custom habit imitation. So he, that was his calling was to be able to do that. He was a social genius. Jesus grew up with, when the corruption of the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the mega church and the fundamentalists. And that's a problem in every tradition. Buddha had the same problem. The Brahmins were basically the mega church and the fundamentalists. Uh, but it was the Hindu Brahmin class that he ran up against. Socrates ran up against the corruption of the Athenians in all sectors of society. So Socrates had conversations with religious leaders, political leaders, artistic leaders, uh, people who recited the religious books, um, artists of all sort, just every sector of society. He even talked about the corruption of the shoemakers and the um, cobblers, you know, the working class how sometimes they're more insightful than the privileged, but sometimes they can be just as corrupt. So Muhammad focused on the corruption in Mecca where there were multiple different sort of uh, tarot card readers and you know people who claim to have some sort of mystical insight into the universe. And they really manipulated people who were poor, desperate, afraid, looking for salvation. Um, there was ignorance, poverty, prostitution, drinking, gambling, citizenism, basically social chaos. So religion, um, animistic polytheism um, has demons are personified, personify people's fears. And this did not inspire people to a better way of life. It just exploited their blind faith and it took their money. Um, so, so there was a need for a savior, a deliverer. And in Hinduism, you have that. You have Vishnu is the deliverer and he comes down in different forms. Krishna was the ninth incarnation of Vishnu. trying, And that was the first one that came in the form of a human being. So that's interesting. So... Muhammad was disgusted by public life. He isolated himself. Um, he was an orphan. I think his uncle raised him. He worked for, then he got a job with Khadija. She was 15 years older than him. And he married her. She was his, his first disciple. But to me, this shows that he had respect for women. He didn't have any problem being... Uh, working for a woman, having a woman be his boss, pro you know, had something to do with being poor. Um, Gandhi also wanted to get to women's equality. All of these, um, all of these prophets, I would say Confucius is the most ambiguous 
but my thing on Confucius is the kind of ruler is very much an anima, a nurturer, not a power domination type of ruler. Um, so Jesus treated women equally, Buddha did, Socrates did, so Muhammad did also. Um, they all reject sort of standard male machismo, animist type behavior. He joined the Hanifs who worshiped Allah. So there was one group who were monotheists and they had all night vigils. And then in 610, the night of power, that was his conversion experience. Jesus had that, Buddha had that. You remember, Buddha had sat for 49 days under the bow tree and had this experience of enlightenment. Jesus went into the wilderness, came out with his sermon. Confucius had a, some kind of revelation and went on the great walk, the great trek. Okay. He was more in middle life at that point. So Muhammad had the night of power. There is a book by Rudolf Otto, The um, Experience of the Holy. And so he's, as a scholar, he recognizes that pattern. So if you want to look that up, it's an older, it's a book I read in, gra in undergraduate school. And I'm, I would gather that there are more books about that. But again, it's a foundational book. I don't think you can deny the idea of the holy as it revealed, as it occurred in the, these people's lives. St. Paul had his road to Damascus experience, but I, I really think there are a lot of human beings who have some type of road to Damascus experience. My students will testify to that, but the, but the psychologists just say developmentally at the end of your 20s, your mind comes together, your brain comes together in a certain way. For some people, it might be a radical shift but for other people, it's just for my children, you know, I want to be a founder and director of an inner city charter school. That's what my son wanted. My daughter, I want to work on international economic development, slave labor projects. My um, other daughter, I want to be a good journalist um, that because of Fox News and all the bad journalism. So they found their sense of calling. Um, she Her first one was arts journalist. Then she got promoted to economic development. But now she covers economic development for nonprofits. So she can really tell the truth and it's not tainted by greed. So, um, so all of my kids had a similar, I would say analogous experience. The prophets, these prophets, um, seem to have a more radical because their destiny is just to speak truth to power, to prophesy. Um, okay, all of them, none of them wanted to be worshipped for them because that's a distraction from the way of life they, they represented. They wanted people to understand there's a mind, there's a spirit behind the behavior they see. They should get hung up on the behavior. They should recognize the driving force underneath it. So Jesus, did anyone understand? What legacy, right? Sometimes um, I remember my father was a minister and his, his sermons, he thought of himself as trying to have a prophetic ministry. But I remember other people telling me stories about my dad, and I don't think they understood. His real motive was to be a prophet in the pulpit, to keep driving, to keep pushing people farther, not to, you know, not, not to defend the status quo, to keep examining the Methodist church, examining corruption within the church, examining political corruption. Um, and he was thankful that he could get paid for it, that the board at his church institutionalized prophetic ministry. Doesn't always happen. I think normally 
the the minister the, tends to defend the status quo. Um, but in Martin Luther King's day, the civil rights movement really had a lot of religious leaders who criticized the status quo. But it wasn't until I was much older that I realized most religious leaders tend to defend the status quo, which I think is really wrong. Um, but Jesus, you know, people can, so when people remembered my dad, some people would say it was really funny. I loved his jokes. And I'm thinking, did you really understand what he cared about, social justice? Or did you just see him as this kind of folksy guy who was really friendly and told funny jokes? And so I think that Jesus wondered, you know, the people who embrace me, what are they going to say I taught? He doesn't know. <laughs> Um, what will his legacy be? Sometimes, you know, your friends defend you and you go, well, that's not really what I was about. Sometimes your enemies criticize you. Of course, you know, in general, that wouldn't be fair. Um, but Alcibiades was the one who turned the furthest against what Socrates wanted, but he understood Socrates better than people who defended him or this this is true of the characters in Plato's dialogues like Apollodorus was passionately in love with Socrates but he didn't understand him whereas Alcibiades understood him and he deliberately went completely against what Socrates wanted and he knew it so there's always that question um Buddha um did not kill himself. Remember when Mara said, why don't you just die? Because he said, there will be some who understand. So still, it's a question. Because Buddha said women can achieve uh, liberation, whereas the documents written 400 years later told nuns to be subservient. They emphasized, they spoke as if Buddha was sexist. And again, the people who tell the stories or pass on the legacy tend to get corrupted by money, power, sexism, racism, um, religious intolerance. And so they don't know what legacy they leave behind. And it's usually a mixed legacy. They probably know that that's likely. So Anybody who has a sense of mission, which everybody should have some sense of mission, should be aware that their legacy might not be what they had thought. I don't know what effect this set of lectures will have on people who listen. I don't know how many people will listen. I don't know how many different ways they will take it, how many different directions. I don't know if I will... Uh, agree with some of them and disagree with what I thought I was saying. I have no idea. It's just that I decided I better just try. I got asked. And so I try to give it all I've got. Um, so Mohammed, his legacy. So um, uh, Indonesian Muslims, humanist Muslims. What sort of legacy do you think Mohammed left behind? He said, I've never said that God's treasures are in my hand, that I knew the hidden things, or that I was an angel. I'm only a preacher of God's word, the bringer of God's message to humankind. Same with the other prophets. They don't want to be worshipped. They're the messenger. So the Greek word for messenger is angelos, angel. Uh, I think that's interesting. Um, the signs of God. So he did not emphasize miracles, but the miracle of creation, the order of the universe, not an event that undermines that order. So this led the Muslims to science long before the West. So this to me is really important because the Greek schools closed down, Justinian closed them down. Now there is a sort of institutionalized chasm between Christianity and Greek paganism, humanism, goes to Persia, 
goes to the Mideast. And this is, you know, the first wave of legacy is that Muhammad focused on the miracle of creation and science. He, you know, you absolutely want science to understand. Well, that would have just been, you know, the synthesis of Aristotle, Greek philosophy, with this understanding of Muhammad, with this quote from Muhammad, is going to have that huge upsurge in um, further development of the sciences, the arts, the speculative thinking, the philosophy, the theology, the, you know, every aspect of culture that happened in those houses of wisdom makes perfect sense. Um, it's just unfortunate from a Muslim point of view that that got, there was a group of intolerant Muslims, orthodoxy focused on the, the logos, the words, not the air God, that, um, that condemned, you know, criticized the Islamicized Aristotelian Greek ethic, the synth that synthesis as heretical and so it was just a power struggle within islam unfortunately um the other issue is that in the bible there are claimed miracles the parting of the red sea or um god stopped the sun you know all these the, there's a few now and then and so the question is does your faith, either Jewish or Christian, depend upon God's intervention in the natural order? Because if that's true, then why do we bother doing anything? The reason is not a guide for free will because God can come in there and change everything. And so that's really important because science knows we're destroying the creation. And so if you think that the miracle of creation is the biggest miracle, and we know that, and we're given the ability, then we are really culpable if we deliberately destroy the creation. If you think the miracles that are important are the interventions, you'll say, oh, we don't have to worry about it because either God will intervene and change the whole order of nature so that what we're doing doesn't destroy it, or, God intended for history to end, and this is the last days. So in order to uh, emphasize the violation of the natural order and the end times, you have to be uh, a very, very orthodox uh, Christian, or I think Christian, you know, the book of Revelation is a, New, New Testament book, but I, you know, you could pick sort of eschatologies, the last times in various religions, but very, very small part of those religions, and definitely not, you know, the bad karma. I mean, for us to create all sorts of bad karma and think that this is a good thing, or Vishnu will come down and fix, you know, fix it, I don't, it just is so anti-intellectual and um, it's just really important that Muhammad said this and that Islam originally was not anti-science it was very compatible with Aristotle it might have it was even consciously compatible with Aristotle because they had the documents um, to some extent I'm sure that some people did some didn't but that for centuries, that was kind of the way it was going. As committed Muslims, each of you has the responsibility, is responsible for passing on the legacy as you understand it. Um, as a lover of Greek culture, I'm responsible for how I tell the story. And I pass down what I think is the legacy. And that's my legacy. And it is growing. I didn't know about this part of the history um, of the relationship between Islam and Jude Judaism and Christianity. 
Another thing I don't know much of anything about is um, the Tigris and Euphrates and the development of Judaism in that area and how that connected. I don't know that the development, that, that chapter in the book. I know this other one, so I hope other people can come together and synthesize all of that. How about Muhammad and the six characteristics of religion? So we're back to Houston Smith, the first lecture I gave, all the prophets had this authority. Muhammad threatened the authority of the polytheistic beliefs. He claimed only one God. He challenged the unjust order. Islam does not discriminate based on race, ethnicity, class, or gender. Um, and the Houston Smith book talks a lot more about that. He ritual. The five pillars are ritual practices. He invented a new ritual, just like Confucius, deliberate tradition. Um, they show um, how the way of life in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount can be lived out in a complete life. So Jesus died too soon. He didn't marry. He didn't have a family. He didn't have a job. He didn't have political power. He wasn't an adult. So he can't, couldn't be a role model. So that's why God sent Gabriel to Muhammad to be the seal of the prophets, to show how you can live out the life in the Sermon on the Mount um, throughout your life. And part of that was this deliberate tradition of the five pillars. Speculation. The Quran is the revelation of God, but it has to be lived in combination with reason and science. He talks about the internal Quran and the external Quran. So even though, you know, it was dictated, came as close as possible to the revelation, Muhammad still understood that when you read the book, you have to internalize it. And the internalized Quran is really your way of life. So just like in the Greeks, you can have that whole set of virtues you can have the theory, you can have it on paper, Aristotle's ethics, but that's not the ergon, the way of life. The way of life, practical wisdom, is when you take all of that, you're confronted with a situation, you're trying to live out your life, and you make decisions, the art of deliberation. So the internal Quran is the character that you bring with you when you engage in deliberation and then you make decisions and you make choices and you learn from your successes, you learn from your failures, you learn from other people, you keep synthesizing things. So I think that's what he means by the internal Quran and that it's jihad is part of this process. And the, the, the conclusions people who are engaged in that process will come to is a function of the character that they bring with them while they're engaged in deliberations about how to apply the written Quran to what's happened since then and to the other documents and advice and also how that applies to situations that confront us. And I do think that uh, Muhammad didn't gather together at the Pontifical Academy with people from all these different traditions. Muhammad wasn't aware of all those different traditions. He didn't meet people who had internalized those traditions. Um, the traditions existed, but Muhammad was definitely focused on the Arabian uh, Peninsula. So, so, we have to adapt it. We have to use its jihad and um, any people from all those religions are literally coming together to engage in that process. And it is a part of the Muslim tradition and legacy. Even though it's controversial, people disagree. There are orthodox um, branches of each of those traditions. So everyone at the Pontifical Academy knew there are people who disagree with us. 
but we have reasons, we have arguments, and that's why we're here. Um, grace. God wants us, or Allah wants us to treat each other justly, to be merciful, to help each other flourish. Love God, love your neighbor on this monistic monism that's consistent with systems thinking, it's consistent with contemporary biology, chemistry, consistent with um, quantum physics. Speculation, the Quran is the revelation of God, but it has to be lived in combination, right? You can't just, um, you can't claim that revelation is completely unaccountable. I had this revelation from God and I can say whatever I want because I think God is telling me this. No, you know, you're accountable. And Muhammad was accountable and he wanted people to be accountable. Mystery, there's no shortcuts. Making the world better is what matters most, right? You can't say, I have this relationship to Allah or God and nobody can criticize me and I can have my own opinions about whatever else. You know, there's other Muslims I think are not real Muslims. And because I had a revelation that told me that, I can say that liberal Muslims are not real Muslims. And I can say that Christians are going to hell. And I can say all this, you know, in the name of this great mystery. It's just, that's not... <laughs> The tradition, that's not what those prophets would want. They felt like they were called, but they held themselves accountable. They held other people accountable. You need to unite reason, faith, action, a way of life, and Aragon. He escaped, um, you know, it was his Hitra in 622. He escaped and he started Medina, the charter to Medina of Medina. It brings together the five tribes, three Jewish into a confederation. Christians and Jews are protected by the laws. They pay taxes and they can't build churches, but he even appointed a rabbi to one of his positions. I think a diplomatic position. But I mean, this is so progressive for that time in 622. Um, it's just amazing, and people should know about this. All of my students in Indonesia knew about this. Um, and I don't think most Christians and Jews know this, that Muhammad sort of set the paradigm for religious toleration in a political community, in a legal constitutional system. Muhammad was a prophet, a statesman, a judge, a general, a teacher. He played all those roles. He was also a father and a husband. Um, he lived a simple life. He was not conscious of class. Um, he wasn't oriented toward orthodoxy. He emphasized justice and mercy in relation to other people. And he knew how to forgive. So... There's way more quotes in the Quran that focus on mercy, 172. There's only 17 quotes that emphasize wrath, vengeance, um, trying to be a, feared, you know, a God of fear. Same in the Old Testament and especially the New Testament that, you know, Jesus emphasized love. Surrender. So the notion of surrender, we recognize our dependence and our interdependence. So this recognition of our dependence on God and God as the creator should make us extremely respected, respected, um, respectful and grateful for the creation. So this really should inspire a sustainable Islamic civilization, or that Muslims would be definitely very much uh, supporting being at the forefront of the creation of a sustainable civilization, which should make it obvious that Indonesian Muslims would really be eager to meet with at the Pontifical Academy 
And the people they got to be at that conference were really prominent scholars. And I'm sure there were many, many more who would have wanted to be there. So, you know, part of these lectures is to try and get together a group of scholars, hopefully prominent scholars, not only in Indonesia, but around the world, prominent Muslim scholars and scholars in the other um, traditions to, to be highly motivated to develop a sustainable, international, sustainable civilization. So what about his social teachings? He was against class splits. He was for generosity, obviously, giving money. Zakat is one of the five pillars. He's against tribalism. Um, it is the five pillars really are connected to Aristotle's virtues. So fasting is connected to that pleasure, self-control, our drive to eat. We gain control of that by fasting. Um, uh, alms, giving alms, that's generosity. Um, going to Mecca, which would should make people aware of how coming together and understanding that Islam is international, but it's also tolerant. And I think uh, Indonesians especially should go to Mecca and tell other people about humanistic Islam and how, you know, the essence of Islam based on scholarship, Muhammad, the Quran, focuses on religious pluralism. He was, um, he focused on interpersonal relationships. He had a just war theory. So Islam has a just war theory and so does um, Christianity. Augustine had a just war theory. They're very, very similar. Um, avoid aggression, defensive only, care for the wounded, respect treaties, treat prisoners decently. Um, the Muslims, so there's this history of Muslim versus Christian, the Crusades, the Inquisition. And Houston Smith says, every religion is used to mask aggression. The politically ambitious use religion to mask their real motives. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting that Houston Smith said this, his book is old. And people think, oh, it's such an old book, it's dated. And the fact that it is not dated is important. So scholars have recognized this long before it has become so common. Uh, since 9-11, the last 25 years, religion has been used more and more as a weapon, and it's becoming more and more successful as a weapon. So you need to know that people, it's always happened and there've always been scholars and prophets calling it out. So the prophets call it out and even the scholars, Houston Smith call it out. And so we have an obligation as scholars, um, as college educated students, even people that don't go on in scholarship to call that out if you're running a business or teaching or anything you do in your in your life, you should call out um, anti-humanistic claims about any religious tradition. You should call out fundamentalism. You should call out the rich religious leaders who defend the status quo and and really baptize their greed and their desire for adulation. Keep calling it out because it keeps coming back. <laughs> and it's frustrating, right? Can't we learn from history? And the answer is no, because every child is born, they have to go through a lot of those same phases and a lot of that same moral training, education and pleasures and pains. Any child that's born can become greedy and wicked 
or power hungry or pleasure driven or attention driven and do a lot of harm. And so we do need to keep reinventing the wheel in terms of moral education. So we're all in this together in the process of habituating children, in the process of coming together to create a sustainable civilization, in the process of connecting STEM disciplines and the kinds of skills needed to participate in the next economic wave with moral education, character building, practical wisdom. We're all in this together. We're so much more alike than different. And that's the main message I have for this lecture on Islam. So I certainly hope my Muslim colleagues will further refine it. If they think there's something wrong, they should contact me. But mostly it's to synthesize, bring things together, work with each other, head in the same direction, and know that we're being faithful to the tradition by doing 